Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to have you here. Um, and it's great to introduce Joe Minicosi. Joe um, came from the design side, but he has done a lot of work to move into the analysis of real estate and the economics of place. The underlying economics that drives how places are the way they are today, as well as um, what decisions we should be making going for forward. And Joe does that work through his firm, Urban Three. Um, you can we see your face, Joe. It's good to, good to see that. Um, take it away. Thanks, Eliza. Um, Y'all can hear me okay? Yeah. I have the uh, radio equipment um, in the room, so uh, let me share my screen. And let's see. Can y'all see this okay? Thumbs up? Yep. Yes, sir. Sweet. Okay. So I'm going to go through a lot of information and then talk about a lot of different ways of looking at cities, and some of it's going to be pretty nerdy. But I want to basically, I start every presentation with how do we think about our communities as they grow? And the easiest way I tend to think about places is they all have a DNA. You have a DNA in Seminole County. I have a DNA in my body. So this is how I started my life when I was three months old. And this is my trajectory. I'm going to be my grandfather whether I like it or not. There's a lot of things I can't do to change that path. There's some great things about it. There's some pretty awful things. But I just, I have to know this, right? Or more importantly, again, when I had hair, um, I look at my father and how I grew into him. So I'm Italian. Is You'll see me wave my hands around a lot, that's the way we talk. But we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease in my family, so I have to do things to plan for my growth in the future. So I have to eat right, exercise. I do a lot of things differently than my father did because I saw that in him. So, so as you think about Seminole County, as you think about your place in Seminole County, as you think about your desires for Seminole County, think of a place that is your model. Who's your grandmother or grandfather? Who, who do you want to be when you grow up? And what are you doing to avoid that? Um, you know, obviously, you're in the Orlando line, line metro sphere. You see a lot of development patterns that you may or may not like happening in your community. But what are you doing differently to change that path? So just, that's it. That's my lesson. I'm going to go through some examples now and maybe walk through different ways to see this. So I live in Asheville. Um, a lot of y'all have probably been to Asheville, we're up in the mountains, just north of, of, it, of Atlanta. Um, beautiful setting, beautiful scenery, bluegrass music, we're 90,000 people, we have 40 breweries, we drink a lot, and like any quirky little mountain town, we have uh, men dressed as nuns on tall bikes to be fire to check out the workplace. But a lot of people, if they don't know about Asheville, they didn't start this way. This is Asheville from not too long ago, boarded up buildings, abandoned buildings, these are shops from the 90s. So it's not like this was uh, the 1960s or anything like that. And we had an attitude that we weren't urban. We weren't a city. We were rural mountain people. And what people chose in saying that is they neglected this very wealth that we had sitting around us, this, this incredible economic opportunity of the city that you all have been to visit to come to our restaurants and drink our beer. Um, I worked for this guy's company, Jimmy Price. He started a, public, uh, a firm called Public Interest Projects. It's a for-profit real estate development company. And back in the 90s, we went to task to start getting these buildings and fixing them up. So let me take a step back. This is what it used to look like, and this is what we did. So that building was sitting back there behind that metal screen, and we just basically made places for people to live and invested in entrepreneurs at the ground floor. So we're doing this because in the scale of human history, there's always been downtowns and there's always been people living downtown. I don't live downtown, but there are people that need that opportunity, and we, have, we afforded that. Now, what we found in doing this, we just thought we were just, again, looking at, at grandparents and replacing that, that there were, this was a downtown before, we're bringing it back. And what we saw is that people weren't even getting past their biases. They were looking at this as a form of theory, but not seeing the data that was present in growing the city. So if we're a $15 million real estate development company, how does the city look at itself, or, or the county look at itself? So if you, if you take simple economics, you talk to any farmer, farmers are talking about agriculture per acre, the, the water per acre, the crop yield per acre, the labor per acre. It's all a system of economics and the crop yield. So this is one of our crops. We rehab this building, put in ground floor retail, second floor office, upper story residential. So the top four floors are condos. The city invested in the street. So the city invested in the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. Great. Thanks, city. 
Uh, this is probably about $20,000 worth of physical improvement. We were actually accused of being subsidized by people, uh, which is kind of awesome. It's like, all right, yeah, fine, $20,000. We took the taxable value from $300,000, you see it on the lower left here, to 11 million. So what the community realized is 3,500% increase in taxes in this property. Do y'all have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Wouldn't you like that kind of investment return? This is building our community's wealth and getting people to see that the downtown investment is paying over in spades. And again, people have biases. They're like, well, Joe, that's cute and everything. That's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here, $20 million. Okay, fair enough. Double the value. But it took 34 acres of our farm to make that happen versus our 0.2 acres. So that's an apples and oranges comparison. Don't look at the big number, look at its production. So rather than total value, let's look at the value per acre, the taxes per acre. So our, our building produces 100 times more taxes per acre per square foot per meter, however you want to look at it. We're way more productive in property taxes, retail taxes, obviously residents, they don't have any, and we've also got more jobs. So when we ran through these numbers, we realized people are asking the wrong questions or they're taking the wrong mindset into thinking about their communities without thinking about building long-term wealth also efficiency and also walkability that these folks that live here could just walk down the stairs to stuff they don't have to get on the road so it saves infrastructure so being trained as a city planner i realized well no one trained us in this math to understand this and this isn't complex math to be honest with you it's fifth grade division if, if we were to talk about cars could y'all imagine if we were having lunch and i'm like my ford f-150 gets 650 miles per tank if i said that you'd laugh at me I'm like joe come on now no one compares anything per tank. It's, all tanks are different sizes. We say miles per gallon, and the numbers just change. And we should all be driving BMW 7, the set is at 70 miles per gallon. So that's, we understand that efficiency with, with a gallon of gas. We should understand that efficiency with an acre of land. Um, in 2009, I, I was in a planning conference, and I had this quote above me. And I spoke to all my peers, building greenways, affordable housing, or whatever, doing smart growth. And I had this quote from Mark Twain, a person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read. This is a quote about literacy. And I asked my peers, Joe Fans, who in this room fully understands the property tax assessment system and how the mathematics of how you run the city works? And not a single person raised their hand. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm trained as a designer. I'm not, I don't have a degree in finance. And what I learned is that we're just not curious enough to look at tax policy and understand that the methodologies of how our cities grow are all financially tuned in. So, so back to tax policy. Tax policy matters because taxes pay for stuff. So this is how you, you pay for the, the greenway, the road, the pipe, uh, the, the, the sanitation engineer that was here before me. You have to pay for the things that run a city. So for our city, this is the value of fixing up. This is the value of downtown in 1990. This is the value of downtown in 2007. We didn't get a new building in downtown until 2008. So that value is called historic preservation. So for you all, you have Sanford. You see how those upper stories that that downtown revitalizes, that actually brings more Seminole County wealth to it because those are all Seminole County taxpayers as well. Now to show you that the Solomon Mount Love and Roses in Asheville, this, is a, this guy's actually a friend of mine, Chris Peterson. Here he is complaining about $26 million of investment in downtown for garages, streetscape projects, et cetera. $26 million is a lot of money. Let me ask you a question. If you invest $26 million in a $100 million asset that grows to 500, is investing 26 and yielding 500 or $430 million more, is that a good return on investment? Yeah. So why don't we confront Chris and say, look, look this is the math. This is, this is how we grow wealth. And, and to be honest with y'all, I know Chris well enough, you're not going to reach Chris. No amount of evidence is going to reach Chris. He has a bias in how he looks at things. And he's even got a website right now with fire and brimstone. This is our mayor getting hit in the head with a lightning bolt right there. I asked the mayor, I'm like, is, is this a liquor drink? And she goes, it should be. And people have biases. Bring me your biases all day long. But you need to understand what you're building there. So my city is the finite boundary of land that has to be managed. If we're a $15 million real estate development company, what's the value of my city? What's the value of my county? Because remember, I'm the county taxpayer too. And I'll tell you, my city's worth $14 billion. My county's worth $30 billion. My city is almost half the value of my entire county. So from a shareholder perspective, we're producing a lot of county taxes. And I'm using these, this language because I want you to understand that 
Our government is this. So when you look up the word incorporate, it says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization is a legal corporation. So by law, Seminole County is just one big real estate operation. You know, I hate to be so crude about it, but it's your city, it's your county. If you live in Oviedo, it's incorporated. Um, it's the state of Florida, it's our country. Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert Show in 2016, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. I am such a nerd that I looked it up at midnight. On the bottom of that slide, the lower right, you see the US code that lists the federal corporation. <laughs> so this is how we operate. Um, Asheville at $14 billion is seven times the value of Ted Turner. So do we expect Ted Turner to just look at Facebook and see who's complaining? Of course not. He wants, he's gonna get that feedback, that's good. But you have to know the numbers of how this place operates. So we've done a lot of different cities, uh, 40 different states, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. When you match up everybody's data, here's what we see. For every dollar of taxes, somebody out in single family out in the county pays to the county and county property taxes per acre, their brother and sister in the prime city is paying about five times that to the same county. So for we in Asheville, we're paying $5 in county taxes for every $1 somebody out in the corporate county pays. Here's the Walmart, here's the mall. This is a two-story building on Main Street. This is a three-story building, and this is a six-story building. So we're not talking skyscrapers here. This is all under the high-rise code. So what you see here is that, that there, there is a benefit to Oviedo doing something in Oviedo that will benefit Seminole County, but we have to realize this is all tied together. Sometimes when people see my presentation, I used to get this earlier on, I'm like, you just hate Walmart. <laughs> you're totally missing the point, that's what, you're, what the takeaway is. In fact, I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference. I don't know if y'all hang out with assessors, but it's not the most dynamic conference on the planet, it's totally square. Um, and this guy got up and did this amazing presentation at eight in the morning on how cheap Walmarts are. And I was watching this and I was like, this is awesome. How efficient is that? You've got 3,000 assessors in one room. So in one meeting, you can get all of your tax bills lowered just by showing how cheap your buildings are. Now, as somebody that's trained in architecture, I was having a heart attack because I was like, how is he getting away with this? Like, why isn't my government protesting? Like, the average Walmart consumes more in police services than it pays in property taxes. Y'all know that? Yeah, are you aware that you're actually writing the check for Walmart when they show up? And it's like, why is anybody upset about this? Now, in defense of assessors, they're agnostic. That's the way it is. So I went up to the microphone and I said, uh, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he shot back 15, maybe 20 years. We designed the building to depreciate it as fast as possible. We'll build another building and depreciate it down again. Some of us have experienced that in our communities where Walmart just moved from one side of town to the other, or it moved, it, it died and moved a little bit further out. That's the way the business model works. Don't hate the player, hate the game. So if this is how our system is operated, it's based on value, there's a perverse incentive to build junk in your community, period. And I and, and need you to know that make the conscious decision. Are you okay with this 20-year 20, 20 investment? That's their commitment to your corporation, which is the life cycle of a cat. Sorry to all the cat people on the person. And, and using this as a joke to realize the temporal nature of how cities change and there's an economic model behind it. And I would argue that people don't see this because we're just not presented the information in a way that we can absorb it. So I'll give you a different analogy. I can show you a picture of your brain with your brain stem activity in blue and your creative thought process in green. We can go in and get an MRI. They'll show us a picture like this and you'll be like, oh, I can see, I can see my brain. This is cool. So can you do an economic MRI of your place? So let's start with my county. This is my county, 350 square miles of area, it's huge. Um, it's a, a little bit bigger than your county. This is all non-taxable right here. This is Mount Mitchell. This is a big part of the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's not taxable, so in gray, it's not worth anything. I'll just, not paying me taxes, I don't care. I'll just be rough about it. On the bottom, you see Mount Pisgah down here. Green is low value. Uh, under 160,000, and when you get to purple, it gets valuable. So the purple is over 76 million dollars in, in value, total value. So this big purple blob right here is the Biltmore Estate. It's America's largest house. It's worth 100 million dollars, way valuable. But it's not fair because it's 140,000 acre or 140,000 square foot house sitting on 8,000 acres of land. This is the biggest gas tank. So rather than total value, here's value per acre, and I won't stop here. Let me just show it to you in 3D. 
Can y'all guess where downtown Asheville might possibly be? <laughs> Boom. So, I'm not, I'm not making this up. We had, we had uh, about 10, 10 years ago, our state legislator called us a cesspool of sin. And I was on the downtown association board at the time, and we're like, really? Like, why are you saying that? Well, you could say that because they had two voters out in the county for every one voter in the city. And the folks out in the county don't like the city. Awesome. Well, guess what? How about, a th how about a thank you card for all the money we're shoveling out for the county? How about a box of chocolates? Yeah. Come on now. So in, def in defense of people out in Fairview out here, they don't know what we're paying in taxes to show it to them. You know? It's like, let's be part of this together. Also, what you can see from a sense of place standpoint, you can see not only downtown Asheville, you can see our little cousin of Black Mountain over here. This is a village of 13,000 people. You can see a little downtown popping up as well. So you can see that sense of place in the model. You also see the productivity with it. So let's have an honest conversation about how to see information and show it to each other. Um, again, biases. People would always tell me, well, that's North Carolina. Our state's different. OK, here's, here's Kansas City. Can you tell where downtown is? Uh, you can also see their streetcar suburb of, of uh, Country Club Plaza. You see how low value they sprawled out. They sprawled out quite well in Kansas City. Um, so you're getting all these costs in the model with very little revenue out of it. Uh, Bozeman, Montana, again, guess where downtown is. This is not a big place, but you can see it's downtown. Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, are y'all seeing the pattern? Um, even something as rural is, is Brevard, North Carolina. North Carolina. This is a village of 8,000 people. Um, when we showed this to them, the mayor, his, the mayor's name is Mayor Jimmy. He's been mayor for 20 years. He goes, well, I can tell where downtown is. This is pretty cool. You know, it's just allow yourself to see the information, but allow yourself to be informed on why we built these patterns for, for generations, right? Actually, centuries uh, before modern America. Modern, modern America kind of spread it out. And we're buying down a lot of infrastructure without a lot of value. So these are all just spatial analyses. And I know this joke doesn't work for certain people, but this is like, it's spatial. Um, yeah, again, is Florida different? Yes, yeah. Um, it starts with how you, um, I'm to be honest, I used to live in Florida. I was here when, I was there when it happened. The tax caps are the biggest thing. So Florida voted through the Save Our Homes Amendment to restrict the growth of revenue of residential to 3% or CPI, which is ever lower of the two. That is awesome. I'm not going to pay for government. But guess what? They're not driving on the road. Um, for commercial, the cap is at 10%. So commercial grows more than three times faster than residential. So it behooves you to get more commercial because that's where you're getting your money. Because as Floridians, y'all, you can cut the cap on the residential. Um, now here's how it works. This is actually from Brevard County, Florida. This is a great diagram. If for anybody, I see y'all taking some pictures. This is all going to be recorded, so you can you can get copies of this whole thing. But one of the things that you'll notice up to the run up up to the recession, um, look at how high the market value is separated from the assessed value. So when the prices take off in a boom, it feels good to stay in your house because your value is just climbing at three percent or CPI, which is ever lower of the two. And this is what's going on in the market. So that gap is super awesome. Well, look what happens when it craters and comes back. So we all went through the recession and the market took off again. Look what's going on with the assessed value. It craters and can only climb out of the basement at 3% or CPI, which is at the lower of the two. Last year, the CPI was 1.4%. Here's a simple question. What's the price of the police car, gasoline, a road, a pipe, is it following the blue line or the red line? It's following the blue line, right? Yeah. So to be able to live in your place, the cost of sustaining your place is going to be the blue line. But you've capped yourself to the red line. So there's a perverse incentive to build more stuff, because that's the only way you're going to get money. So we've essentially done something that we thought was great to not pay taxes, but the cost of government is not going to follow that. So here's the cost of asphalt from, from FDOT. 3% um, last year, or sorry, per year, averaged over the last 10 years. So asphalt is going 3%, your cap is at 1.4%. That's really simple economics. The average price of asphalt is doubling your cost of your revenue. If you just look at what asphalt did last year, this is from the Federal Reserve. It, it went from an index of 280 to, uh, to 360. So the math on that is a 29% growth 
just in last year. So when you talk to your government, you've got a pothole, you've got to fix a road, they have to pay attention to that number. So this is the thing, it's all tied together. We need to understand the economics, how this all operates. And here's your model. This is this is Seminole County. Uh, you can see how Winter Springs pops up, downtown Oviedo. Um, Sanford does quite well, and then Sanford flattens out real quick in the outside. You've got a couple of, I call them pixie sticks, kind of pop up along where the transit lines are. So that's super, super potent. I mean, they feel like big buildings to you, but they're ridiculous taxpayers. Um, and just to zoom in, some of y'all might be in Oviedo. Uh, we did your model. This is this is Oviedo's uh, downtown. Here's some examples in downtown. Uh, the townhouses are pulling about four million dollars an acre. Uh, oh, by the way, your your, your Walmart is uh, about seven hundred thousand an acre. Your townhouses are four million. Park Place apartments are about four point four million. The Strand is about seven million. The Strand apartments are about four point six million. To show you a comparison, okay, so we're like four million is at the low end here. This is single family and Oviedo is about a million. So, so the, those projects are four times the productivity. When you get into multifamily, um, you can see it goes from two million dollars to four million bucks. So this is the kind of stuff you want to get in your transit station because folks are sacrificing in their quantity of space to buy into that walkability, but they're also paying quite handsomely in taxes. Um, and to just isolate the, the lofts at Altamont, it's 17 million. The station house apartments in Lake Mary is 11 million an acre. But multifamily in general is double single family in production when you look at the whole sample across the whole county. To, to show you kind of like an apples and apples comparison, if you had an acre of the Strand Apartments building, which is basically if you go to the Strand Apartment building and just take a third of it, one third of that building would equal the 12 acre Home Depot from a, from a, from a production standpoint. So again, I'm throwing a lot at you, I just want to realize there's ways to look at this stuff and just allow yourself the curiosity and, and, and to just look at this, look at these the data points and say, what are we building here? What are we going to grow into in the future? This is the process that you're going through right now. And I'll, I'll show you different ways to leverage this. Uh, quickly, bef before we get off the topic of data, retail, um, in the state of Florida, they don't give you a whole lot of ability to look at it. So we generally say there's not much you can do, but I'll give you some more detailed states where they give us more access to data. Colorado is one of those places. Incidentally, Alabama and South Carolina let us look at the data too, but Florida, apparently not. Um, so here's the property tax model for Durango. Durango is way isolated in the middle of nowhere. He's, here you see the county gets all the property taxes, the city gets the retail taxes. So downtown is killing it. So the county should be all over making more downtown happen. Um, South Durango is where the mall, the Home Depot, the Walmart, all that's in this little, little plate that sticks out here. So when you get into retail, this is the retail model. So downtown is still killing it. There's total productivity, jobs, any way you slice it and dice it, you see that those, those high density, mixed use environments are super, super productive. Um, and we'll get into the cost side in a second too, but I just wanted to go through the retail in detail. So just to get past some biases that we all carry. Um, these are two mom and pop shops. They gave us their books, Peter and Tim. Peter has a bookstore, Tim has a coffee shop. Um, and here they are on Main Street compared to Walmart. Here's the county property taxes per acre for those two little businesses on the right versus the Walmart on the left. Apples to apples. Who would have thought that those little businesses are, what is that, 15 times the property tax production and seven times the retail production? So those little shops are highly potent. Now the thing is, they never have the opportunity to advocate for themselves because they're just mom and pop shops. They don't have somebody that's got a PhD in retail that's gonna come in and make their case for them the way that Walmart does. Um, and then here's the jobs. Again, way more jobs. Now these are all retail sector jobs, but who's paying the retail sector employees more per hour? The blue side or the, or the gray side? Probably the blue side. It's probably gonna be a nickel more, a dime more, but it's gonna be more. Now let's ask the next question. Who's hiring the attorney, the, the accountant, the website designer that's local? Is it gonna be the right side or the left side? It's gonna be the right side. So we inadvertently harm ourselves if we don't create opportunities for local entrepreneurs to succeed in our community, or we don't engender them to have that environment. We make it more difficult when we get the chain established. And so this isn't to say I'm anti-chain, it's just understand how we're productive. And we've created a system 
that actually makes it easier for them to do their job, that it creates a landscape that disallows us the ability to have the greenway, the art teacher, or the dancing traffic cop. You know, we don't we don't buy that stuff because we don't have the money. It's actually in a different form of, of, of government. Uh, does that all make sense? So let's kind of jump ahead to the, the cost side. Um, so oftentimes, again, a bias that people have is when they see growth, they just, they, they conflate it with their making income. So I'll give you a, maybe an extreme example is Lancaster, California, which is outside the edge of Los Angeles, way out from Los Angeles. It's out in Los Angeles County, over the mountain range. Uh, Lancaster, this is what they grew to, there are 166,000 people. Um, they should have a bigger downtown than they did, but they basically just spread out. Now in that spread, this is the thing that kind of got me, is they have 953 miles of roads. Um, I've worked in planning for over 30 years, and I'll tell you, I still don't know what a mile looks like, so we put it on a map so people can see it. They have enough roads to go from Los Angeles to Portland. So every 50 years is how long roads last. It depends on your environment. So in case of being in the desert, roads only last 30 years. Um, now, one of the things that becomes a problem is how government looks at roads. And I don't know if you all know this, but when you look at the government books, they list roads as assets. This is kind of mind-numbing to me. When I sit with government finance officers, I explain to them my computer is an asset. If I had a delivery van or if I had a piece of real estate, those are assets. And, and I ask them, um, I can sell my computer, my van, or my building. Can Seminole County sell their roads to Osceola County? <laughs> no. So that's a liability, it's not an asset. Or if you're going to see it as an asset, you need to look at the ongoing maintenance obligation. So in real estate development, when we buy an asset, if I bought a mall in your community and I own that mall, I know I have to maintain things like these air conditioners. Those air conditioners are not cheap. They're $85,000 a piece. And I have to get $35,000 together to hire a sky crane and a crew. So every 15 to 20 years, I have to spend about $205,000. So what I do is I squirrel away a little piece of rent called a reserve account to eventually pay for that cost. So if we do the same thing with roads, here's what happens when a road gets built. That road lands in your community. There is an ongoing maintenance obligation every single year that you have to spend on it. It's about two cents a square foot or $100 a mile. Every 10 years, you have to do a rehab or a re resurfacing. That's going to cost the money. It's going to cost about $310,000 a main mile. And you have to do that every 10 years for four cycles. After the fourth cycle, you have to do what's called as a rehab project. And that's about 50 years out on average. Um, in in y'all's state, it's a little bit less than that. But you're, you're looking at about $840,000 a lane mile, and then you get to restart that again. This is what happens with infrastructure. It doesn't disappear, you have to keep on fixing it. So when you look at that number, let's kind of jump ahead. This is Lancaster's roads. This is when they built all of their roads. So when you look back, to 1950, you can see this big lane miles that they laid down in that one that one period. And you can see it like after World War II, they got a little nutty. That's why. Well, guess what? This comes back for the first rebuild here, and it brings along with it new construction. Because when the community was hit with that huge capital expense, what they did is they let out more development. More development means more money coming in the door. Y'all are doing that because of your, your, your tax cap. You're letting development keep on coming because you have to, you can't afford your government. So they do the same thing. They let out more development, which means more roads. This comes back with the second rebuild and brings along with it the new stuff. So this is the cycle they're in. So we showed them, like, look, I'm gonna stop you in 2016. You're not gonna build another road from here to infinity. This is what your carrying cost looks like. And this is not inflation adjusted. This doesn't, doesn't take into account that the asphalt is a fossil fuel that is becoming more and more difficult to make. So when you look backward in time, and seriously, y'all, go, go and pull any literature from the 1950s and see if anybody was penciling out the long-term costs of this development pattern that we took on completely without thinking it through after World War II. Every city went through this huge convulsion. And then in the 1980s, we took our biases with us and said, this is who we are, this is how I want to live, we need to repeat this. Rinse, wash, and repeat. So once you do that, repeat it. Notice how it's getting bigger and bigger, and I'm not adding more roads. So this stuff is compounding on itself because of the scale of what we've done. 
So in the case of Lancaster, when you flush their money into the, into the system, they can only afford 50% of their rates. This is the situation that they've gotten themselves into. And, and they're not alone. Um, American cities have, have gotten down this road without thinking it through. Okay. I've gone through a lot of stuff. I know that this is super depressing. There is a way out of this. Um, and I'll show you maybe a couple examples on that. Eugene, Oregon, um, we did a revenue model. We can see where that town is. But what's cool about this model is it was a full return on investment model, or ROI. So this is the whole city floating in the lake. And this is the cost, or the, re the revenue, sorry, of what people are paying in taxes. This is the cost of people's lifestyle choices. So folks that live out here, this is what they're paying in taxes. This is what it costs the community to support them. So if you met your cost against your revenue, you'd have what's in the black and what's in the red. This is the top of the model. You can see what's net productive in the top of the model. If you lift this up like you're looking for a salamander under a rock, you can see the spread of subsidy across the model. So in their community, this is their numbers. And this is the cost and consequences of what's going on. So to break this down into some building typologies, the ingredients that make up a city, um, these are your sample ingredients. I call this the Brady Bunch slide. But you have residential, low density, medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium, high, commercial, low, medium, and high. And these are the sticker prices for each one of them. What is the market if you're paying somebody $1,400 an acre to live in a single family detached house? That is a subsidy, right? We're paying people to live there, that cost. So we're not charging enough for individuals to live there, and other folks are carrying the burden at a higher level and paying more than their fair share. That's the reality of math. Now, I understand this is a political as well. So when we presented this to the community, we understood what we were telling the community. It's like, look, y'all are subsidized. This is the reality of the American system. And people want single-family housing because we've incentivized it to such a high degree that it's something we want. I get that. But you can't have subsidy for 80% of your land use. So for them, they have to think of other alternatives. This isn't to say we're going to take your house away. This isn't to say single-family housing is evil. It's just to acknowledge the costs and consequences of it. So if you think of your city like a, or community or county as a tree ring, it's going to have a core up on the right, and it's going to, it's going to dissipate its way out and de-densify as it goes further out. It's more expensive to do that because you still have to get a house, a, a, a pipe, and, and a road out there. There's still storm water to put all that. You have to balance this stuff out. So in their community, definitely they have to reinforce doing stuff downtown. Again, even though this is a Seminole County project, you should think about the cores of uh, Lake Mary and Sanford and Oviedo. Those produce wealth for your county as well. Um, but look up here at, at this thing called Crescent Village in the north. That's doing quite well, and it's out, out of the edge of town. So why not find four more places to cultivate that wealth? Um, just as we're, because we're going through this, I want to reinforce this is Florida. You have a tremendous issue with water. Um, it's super expensive to move water around. In an extreme, extreme example, we did this in Lafayette, Louisiana. They have these like concrete things called coolies, these like concrete rivers. Uh, that's our head analyst, Josh's first visit to a coolie. He was pretty excited about it. <laughs> but we had, to sh we had to show them what the landscape was like. So what we did is we took, in, in flat places like swamps, you can't see that there's topography. So we took, we took Lafayette and stretched it out like an accordion and put each rise of inch of, of, of land to like 500 feet. And you can see where the old downtown is. Now as I rotate the model, check this out, you can see there's a ledge in how it falls off. So that's happening around y'all's landscape. So be aware of that. We saw this in Oviedo. Well, the river is where the water needs to flow out. And when you lay the topo on it, you can see a ridge on it. So if in my world, we have mountains. So we basically turned it and inverted it upside down so we could show them the mountains and show them where the ridge is. Their ancestors settled on the ridge because they didn't, couldn't afford stormwater. Then they bought all this extra stormwater and just kind of stretched out into it. Well, guess what? Look at how they're bleeding. So they can't afford the place that they built. And these are the systems that we put in place to fight Mother Nature, but it's super, super expensive. So just be aware of that in, in y'all's case. Um, development patterns matter because the cost and consequences of that infrastructure is tied to it. So I'll just give you an example. This is in South Bend, Indiana. These are 88 houses, and these are 88 houses. Two totally different ways of laying out 88 houses, right? On the left, we have a grid. 
on the right, we have a cul-de-sac of cul-de-sacs. And let's just walk through the cost of it. These are actual numbers from South Bend, Indiana. These are the eight houses. This is the, the obligation for roads, so about $75,000. This is the water pipes, another $12,000. Sewer and storm sewer is about $35,000 for that. So the total cost for this community is about $122,000 a year. That's maintenance costs plus the reserve account. What they're actually paying in per year is about uh, 21000 So that's a subsidy of about $100,000 for this neighborhood. Y'all follow me? Let's go through the other 80 houses. I'm going to fly through this really fast and come back to a chart. So it's $79,000 for its cost, $22,000 for its revenue. So on the left, $79,000 of total cost. On the right, $122,000. The income's pretty much the same. The subsidy is very different. So one and a half times the cost, about equal revenue, translates to almost two times the cost for the neighborhood on the right versus the left. Now, living on a cul-de-sac is awesome. You don't have traffic. You don't have those externalities. You don't have any of that stuff. But you've created an additional cost and burden on society for that desired effect. So we just, let's just be honest with folks. Here's the numbers. Can we afford this? Is this something that we want to have? Is this where we want our priorities and our, our municipal investment to go? And there are other ramifications in transportation quality, particularly you all see this in Florida. Everybody is forced onto one or two roads, which creates huge traffic congestion because no one wants to have any grid or interconnectivity. So we provide the wrong incentives the way that we do this stuff. Um, and I'll give you one, one last example, which is Indianapolis, Indiana, where we did a transit corridor study for this, uh, for the a bus line that was going east and west through here's a bus rapid transit. One of the first things that we looked at was their land use patterns. They have, these are the buildings, surface parking. Again, this is the whole county. Uh, they're looking at 27% of the county is surface parking, 30% uh, roads, 40% uh, uh, build, uh, buildings. Now, this isn't fair because there's other stuff, so let me break it down a different way. Here's parking, here's buildings, here's roads, this is everything else. Burns, buffers, backyards, farms, parks, whatever, and then there's water. Water doesn't pay taxes, so let's keep it outside the box for a second. When we build our community this way, it translates into a financial model. So this is the money that comes in the door. The buildings pay for almost everything. Um, roads cost them about $17 billion. And everything else, all the stuff that we love, your backyard doesn't pay that much taxes. Your front yard doesn't pay that much taxes. So everything else is only contributing 20, 12 billion, even though it's taking up 306 square, mile, uh, uh, square miles. Incidentally, that's as big as your county that takes up that space. Check out parking, however. Parking is half a billion dollars of value and roads are 17 million. If you look on the left, you see that roads and parking are the same footprint. This is the subsidy that we place toward parking. So when we say we want parking, be aware, it's subsidized. You're essentially spending for it. It's not free, okay? The roads, you have to rebuild. The parking isn't going to pay for it, so you have to raid the building fund to pay for the roads. So that takes money away from the teacher, the greenway, whatever. So going back into the transit corridor, this is the, um, we did a five minute walk radius outside of each transit shed to see how are they doing there? Are they dense enough to pay for the, pay for the transit? We dropped downtown out. Here's the pie chart. I was sort of a little freaked out by this because you probably don't remember the first pie chart, so let me bring it back. They actually have more land in the transit corridor dedicated to surface parking than they do countywide. This is a recipe for failure because that transit corridor is dependent on density, getting people to walk to the bus, and it takes them off the transportation system as a car trip. So if you want to do that, you've got to get as many people by that transit system as possible. So this isn't to say that you need to move next to the bus. It's to say to make that work, you need to do that. Now the financial side of it is this. This is Marion County's average numbers. Um, this is the average resident, there's Marion. Um, she has about 1,200 square feet of buildings dedicated to her. 1,000 square feet of roads and about 800 square feet of parking dedicated to her. When this gets built, it translates into a financial system. So this is the numbers for the financing side. The building's pulling about 52 bucks a square foot. The roads, or the parking's about 75 cents a square foot. The road costs you about $22 a square foot in front of the building and $22 a square foot in front of the parking. 
realize that. Your cost is the same in front of both those objects. The revenues are wildly different. So if you're paying, we just, just for the fun of it, you rub it in, like, let's just take half the property taxes that are paid by the building per year and half the parking uh, property taxes and put it into a savings account to see how long it takes each of them to pay off the road in front of it. So it takes 42 years for the building to pay off the road. It takes 3,000 years for the parking to pay off the road. Remember what I said about roads? They only last about 50 years. So this is how we built ourselves into this problem, biases. We don't think through the economics of all of this. And before I leave this topic, let's talk about cars. So in Indianapolis, these are the households with no vehicles, one vehicle, two vehicles, and three vehicles. So when you look at the data, 50% of the county has one car or less per household. You all see the pie right there. 50%. When you look inside the bus corridor, you're looking at 60%. So not everybody has a car. Why do you have a policy where you have you require two parking spaces per residential unit? As a developer, if you make me build that, I'm going to put that into the cost of the development. And it's going to drive the cost of the housing up. You don't need it. The numbers show that. But when people make decisions, oftentimes the people in the room are people with cars. They just assume everybody's got a car. Why are you going to design your city that way? or your county, or your place. So since we did Oviedo, we did your numbers, and you'll notice that they're pretty much the same. 81 bucks, you're a little bit more valuable in the building, at $81 a square foot in Oviedo, 75 cents a square foot for the parking, $22 a square foot for the road in front of both. Now, going forward in this process, how do you use this now? What can you do? Uh, we did a project in Rancho Cucamonga, California, which is I love saying that word. It's probably the funnest city name I've ever done. Rancho Cucamonga. But uh, Rancho is way outside of Los Angeles in the exurbs. And in defense of that community, Los Angeles is insane. I don't know if y'all know Los Angeles. It makes Oviedo seem like a Rust Belt city. Um, this is, uh, this is the, an area called the Inland Empire. It's these two counties outside of Los Angeles. And when my analyst was showing this to me, um, and Josh came in and he's like, look, Joe, it's 4.6 million people, it's 27,000 square miles. I don't know what that means. So he did this. He's like, yeah, it's the same size and population as South Carolina. Did you all know that? Yes. I didn't. I can name cities in South Carolina. I can't name anything other than Rancho Cucamonga <laughs> in the Inland, Inland Empire. I know. Charleston, Greenville. And so this area grew up without growing up. You know? So here's what it looks like. You know, this is like flat as a pancake, right? This is your downtown. If it weren't for the fact that I highlighted it, you'd never see the downtown in the small. You wouldn't see the purple mountain, right? So from the economic standpoint, it takes up 2.5% of the city area. It's only producing 1.5% of the property taxes. Way underdeveloped. It's like a one to less than one ratio of Purple, purple up there, right? So I'll show you why this matters. Here it is in that model. Let's go back to Brevard for a second, that town of 8,000 people. It's pulling a one to six ratio of area to production in the pocketbook. And again, this isn't to say y'all need to live in a downtown. It's just be aware that you need something like that going on in your community to be able to afford the suburban lifestyle or even the rural lifestyle is even more expensive. So just be aware of that, unless you're never driving. In Asheville, we're at one of six. So for, from their case, they, need, they in their defense, they only grew up their suburbs. They didn't know how to do a downtown because they just were like, oh, that's, that's Los Angeles, that's something else. Florida cities did the same thing. We depend on our prime cities, we don't necessarily think about growing ourselves up. So here's what they missed. Their downtown right now is worth 3.9 million, or 391 million. What they should have had, if they grew their downtown up at the same rate as their, as their suburbs, their downtown should be about $4 billion worth of value. We know for a fact that Oviedo takes this stuff seriously. They're trying to, trying to grow up their downtown. That's going to benefit all of Seminole County. But you have to think of other areas beyond those cities inside the county that are going to be doing this. You could have a new village center or a new corridor that's going to grow up. You have to think about that opportunity. So, when they left and worked with their planners, you're going to be working with, with uh, Eliza's team. Talk with them about how to grow up areas. And they did this. They kind of thought of different areas, what they want to have, and they glued new buildings in. 
it, and to come up with future value if we did a projection of this is what it looks like. So let's put them side by side. Um, basically by messing with 12% of the land area of the, of the municipality, they grew $2 billion worth of value by concentrating it in an area to be efficient. Um, and just to close on, on one point, so this is maybe a takeaway. I need you to realize that policies that are out there aren't perfect, but you can make them more perfect. But there's a lot of weird things in policies that you need to be aware of. So back to the assessment conference. The reason why I was there was to show them this map. Uh, this is a map of just land value in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So land value per acre. So you can see this neighborhood in the upper left, so everybody's blue up here. That means that they're about the same average at like $15,000 an acre. When I was presenting this to the county in uh, Cheyenne, I was in the library and I was like, I was like, what's going on here where this is 15,000 acres? I don't know if y'all seen that cursor. That's the mall. So the dirt under the mall is $15,000 an acre. Now remember, there's no buildings here, it's just dirt. When you cross the street in the same zoning category, it doubles in value to orange. So it goes from 15,000 to 30,000. The tax assessor raised her hand and she just yells out at me. She goes, no, 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 you don't understand. And I'm like, what am I missing? She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the value. The mayor just started laughing. I'm like, really? I get more land, it's cheaper? And she goes, yeah, that's our, that's our, that's our assessment. But, but there's less people that can afford large tracts of land, so therefore there's less of a market demand, so therefore there's less value. I said, all right, I've got three miles of roads around this property, which means I have more infrastructure. This fellow's only got 200 feet. She goes, we don't count infrastructure as part of valuation. That's not how we look at the economics. Okay. Um, this is a bigger property. I can probably put something bigger on it, which means I'm going to drive more trips to it, which means more car accidents, more police calls, more fire calls. She goes, yeah, we don't look at any of that. So I went to the assessors conference to ask them, because their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. I said, how is this fair and how is this equitable? To the credit, they're like, it's not. I was like, where did the standard come from? Did Moses deliver it to you? <laughs> they thought this was hilarious, by the way. Um, this, this is a joke that kills that at the assessor's conference. And I'm like, how would this steer the market if you're giving these incentives in the system? So be aware of this, that this is going on, that we all fall prey to these things, and we just have to ask questions. Is this what we want? Can we afford it? So we call this practice geo-accounting. We're just going to put it on a map, show it to you. We'll give you all the models that we did for, for a veto. Y'all can have them. But just be aware that this is the economic situation of policy effects. And some of these policies are weird. That one in particular for the assessment, where these are. So your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, right? Your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. So look at the models, look at the maps that we gave you. Have fun with them. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to take it too seriously. Just be aware that you're evolving with the system. And also be aware that Seminole County is worth $53 billion. Billion. You know, it's like 23. You could go out and buy 23 Tampa Bay Buccaneers if you wanted to. And, and we all know that they're watching, uh, was it Joel Glazer knows Tom Brady's power bill. I know that the cups in our nightclub that our company owns cost five cents a pop. We know that because we have to understand the economics, how that business functions. So understand the business functions of how some of economy operates and do the math properly. I'll leave you with a couple of books. Um, I'm a big fan of Strong Towns. A lot of our work is covered in these two books uh, that Chuck writes about. Um, I highly recommend looking at Chuck's blog and, and following his work. Um, because it gives you a, a primer on, on how we do math. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I guess we're going to move into the question and answers. And uh, thanks for letting me do some math. Thank you, Jeff. So hopefully you appreciate now why Joe does these presentations all over the country. And we're really glad to have him um, piped in via the magic of the internet. Um, to us here in Seminole County. Um, so we'd be happy to take questions. D does anyone have a question? Would you mind coming up so Joe can hear you? Joe is there. Joe and Joe. <laughs> so if you're speaking to this mic so they can hear you and speak towards that mic so Joe can hear you. And this is also Joe. <laughs> yeah, we're Joe squared. So, and, and I'll, be, I'll be in Asheville uh, next weekend. So anyway, my question about Basically, everything that you did was great. It's very, very enlightening because, like I said, it's all boiled down to the math. My question that's 
as far as what's happening now, and obviously re recovering from COVID and the slow return to the cities, how are you, how are you seeing that affect the, the, the work that you guys have done up to this point in some of these areas? Because I just read this morning again, some areas returning faster, other areas slower. Some areas, now they're even saying that if you don't want to come back to work, well, guess what? We're going to lower your pay scout. So there's a lot of dynamics at this point. So I'm just curious as to how that is going to affect us going forward. Thank you. Yeah, there's um, I mean, there's a lot, lot of change. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, look what's going on right here. I'm, I'm not there, but yet I'm in the room. Right. So this, this advance in technology is, is affording things to change. Um, you, you know, actually, let me show you something. Well, just to point that up, I'm going to do a, a brief um, announcement. We did have some no-shows on the lunch, so if you did not get a lunch and would like one, or if you ordered a lunch and did not get one yet, please go now and grab one. Uh, and that includes staff. So if you were being, some of our staff were being very nice and not getting their lunches in case somebody did, somebody showed up. So please do that now before you give your lunch away. Well, I'll, I'll just, I grew up in Rome, New York. Um, Rome, New York is desert door now. It's probably not back. Um, it's, it's not coming back because of what we did to ourselves. We tore down our entire downtown, um, or my predecessors did. Um, but you look at Rome, Italy, how many pandemics did Rome, Italy survive? You know, it's, it's like, we're a social animal. We will work together. This is how we operate. I don't want to kill my own chicken. <laughs> Sorry, not going to happen. I will buy one, right? So this is how human civilizations have worked for millennia. We have built cities. This thing that we we live in now, that is more auto centric, is we have, we have built our cities around um, our prophecies, right? It's like it's like a it's like a crutch, where if we don't have a car, we can't survive. Yeah. Anybody that's traveled, you you visit all the places, you sort of built places that you can do most of your stuff by walking around or biking around or something like that. And again, this isn't to say everybody has to get rid of the car. This isn't an anti-car message. It's just that the car needs to fit into society, not be how society operates. So I think the same is true with technology. I've got folks that work virtually. We work so much better when we're together. So, you know, it, people will learn and people will adapt but at the same time. We're going, to, we're going to iterate with technology that I can do this without having to charge your community for a plane ticket, a hotel room, an extra day. It's so much more efficient for me to just do this from there. Now, would it be better if I were in the room chit-chatting with you? It probably would be, but we're, we're all going to adapt. So I, I, think, I think societies will adapt, but it's going to be marginal compared to the longevity of how we've lived as, as humans is going to stay pretty consistent. Um, there's a great book called Sapiens that I'd recommend about the history of how humans um, have lived. There's also uh, Lewis Mumford's The History of the History of Cities, which is a very dense book to read. But um, it's really easy to think about. Back to the grandfather, you just go to old and grandmother, you just go to older places. Um, so if you want to see rural, go visit New Hampshire. And when you visit New Hampshire, you'll find pretty urbane places that should be Manchester, right? So you can have both. Questions? Would you mind coming up? And we're probably only going to have maybe two more questions, depending on how long Joe's answers are. So uh, don't be shy. This was a great presentation. It actually got your brain thinking differently. Sorry. It's actually to get your brain thinking, period. But my question was, when we have these density places, uh, how does that affect things like schools and police force and all those other type of activities? Um, that's a great question. Uh, schools need to be in the conversation. I call them the third government. Um, oftentimes, the school's revenue is that of the prime city that's there, which is kind of mind-boggling to think about. Um, you know, if, if you can get the schools in proximity to the kids being able to walk to school, if you can build safe routes to schools so the kids can bike to school, 
Um, that's the primary driver of the, the urban design that they're in. So, you know, back in the day, schools were in the neighborhoods. Kids all walked to school. I walked to school when I was in grade school. Um, but we designed places where it's too hostile for a kid to make their way to a school. That shouldn't just be like, oh, that happened. That should be a point of serious interrogation. How did we let this happen? And what it is is a lot of things. We've, we've desired to spread ourselves out. We've built networks of transportation where we for forced all the cars into certain areas. So we've made hostile environments well intended. We were trying to like make good um, neighborhoods where we thought if we get rid of traffic, it's going to be awesome. We, you never get rid of traffic. You actually just push it somewhere else. So, so that's the thing I would, I would think about is think about walkability. If you could design the world for an eight-year-old, it's going to work great for an eight-year-old. Yeah, and, Remember that. and I would imagine since we're talking about cost today, we did this research for uh, a neighboring county a few years ago. The busing is a huge cost for the school system. So yep. that's money that's not going towards educating kids. It's just going towards moving them around. Uh, we got another question here. Nancy. Try to voice towards that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joe. It was an excellent presentation. Um, what I, the, what I'm gathering from this is you're asking us, or you're you're telling us that we have to make a transition in our way of thinking. And as I think about it, the people who are 40 years and older are the people who are going to have the hardest paradigm shift to to even think about paying a different tax rate or more taxes versus uh, building downtowns up. Right here, right now in Seminole County, we, we have this big fight about apartments. And I think a lot of the conversation and the argument about apartments is, is that we have all these roads that are clustered full of people. And so the more apartments, the more cluster full of people. We don't have transportation available. So you're, you're talking to us, and we're in here for the purpose of trying to help ourselves better where we're going. And I, I just wonder, from the survey that we have, I mean, I'm looking at, say, do you think there should be a balance between urban, suburban, and, and nature? And I'm thinking, well, of course we do. But th how does that get us to where you're talking? Um, show of hands, who in this room wants to pay more taxes? <laughs> I mean, most, oh, you got one in the back there. Most of y'all look like you're over 40 to me. Um, so I don't think it's just the 40 year olds and under that don't want to pay more taxes. Uh, another show of hands who in this room has never, ever lived in multifamily? So we've, okay, we got one person, maybe two. We've all lived in multifamily. The majority of this room has lived in multifamily at some point in our life. And we have to acknowledge the fact that that's part of housing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people, and actually we've got the data to show that it's not multifamily that's producing kids, it's single family that's producing kids. So the majority of children are coming from single family housing, which is the majority of the cost, period. Um, worse is when you start stretching those houses out and hey, if you're a farmer, if you're a ranch hand, if you're a, 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 a lumberjack, awesome. Live out in nature. We make the problem worse when we choose to live out in nature and we're not in that ecosystem. So that's the reality of growth. That's been the American paradigm. We want to be in nature. Everybody wants to be in nature. The problem is when somebody else moves out there with you. And then all of a sudden it's a problem. You know? And so, I mean, trust me, this happens in Asheville all the time. People move out to the mountains, particularly people move out here from Florida, and they're like, this is awesome, I'm living out in nature. And then they get upset about the bears. It's like, well, then don't live out there. Um, but somebody's got to build that wood out there. So if I have a road and I have two people on it, it's way more expensive for the world than if I have. 200 people on it. That's the reality of economics. The more people you put on the infrastructure, the cheaper it gets. So just realize that if you buy into a low density, stretched out environment, it's going to be expensive. Somebody's got to cover that. So I think, um, Joe, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Okay. There you go. And speak towards that little green light. 
Hey, Joe. I, I really apologize. I went to the wrong building, so I came in late. But I am going to buy the book so I can catch up on some of this stuff. And, but, and we did record it. So. And, oh, perfect. And so I may have missed this, and you may have already talked about it, but I had two big questions for the, for the discussion today. One is, um, how does tax policy change the government's um, development strategy? And what I mean by that is, um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, partially, and Jarvis Gann hit, and one house pays $50 in taxes, and the one right next door goes for three, five, you know, 7,000 in taxes, um, because they've lived there, and they don't move, and the schools go away and stuff. Here in Florida, we have Save Our Homes, which did the same thing. You could be living in a home and paying far less taxes than the person that just bought it, next door for 700,000 when you bought it for 200,000 10 years ago. Um, other examples here that are different from Asheville and stuff and some of the other places that I heard you mention, um, Beachside in Volusia County. The hotels there you think are wealthy and doing well, but they pay taxes based on income. So they may not be paying hardly anything. So how do you reconcile government's development strategy and tax strategy with the external where the legislature or the federal government or somebody kind of pulls the rug out from you or changes the homestead from 25 to 50 and therefore pulls you know a lot of your funding away from your services and the second part of the question was is there ever too many um, people are leaving Vegas because they're tearing up the grass. The water's going down. Um, my sister called me from California and asked me to look for a house here. And I said, no, you don't want to come here. So, you know, as everybody comes this way, if you look at Chicago or New York, their taxes are extremely high um, and their services are degrading. So is there a point where you build too much and your services just can never keep up with it? Thank you. Well, first, first. Part. Um, let's see if I can keep this all straight. Well, first, first part, yes, you are the same as California, period. Um, California, when they did the Prop 13 that spread like wildfire, there's probably, like, I want to say, 35 states that have something very similar to Prop 13. There's Measure 50 in Michigan, um, and, uh, and, and whatever. There's, they're all out there. It's these are self-inflicted wounds, wounds, folks. This wasn't the state legislature that, that did save our homes. That was a state amendment to the Constitution that you all did, citizens did. So don't think that this is divorced from you all sitting in this room. Um, can you change it? Certainly. Um, should you change it? I would say yes. But also, that, that, that tax flow model that I showed you through Eugene, the, the red-black model, think of it this way. When we buy our phones, right? Don't you think Apple charged me for this case, the glass, the software? Of course. So why depend on a property tax system to hope that it all works out? Think of the roads per linear foot. For anybody that grew up in the north, think of it like a snow plow. The amount of frontage you have is going to be the cost of that plow, right? The longer the frontage, the more you're consuming of that plow the shorter the footage the less. There is a trade-off. I would like to have lots of land. I would like to have a 20-acre yard. I don't want to hear somebody's dog bark, right? I would like to have a full head of hair, too. I think you all should pay for that. <laughs> this, this is what we say in public. This is what I want. Great. Awesome. Just make sure that you follow with, this is what's going to cost society for what I want. And, and I'll tell you, North Carolina ain't perfect. We can't do... Like, we don't have, we don't even have a homestead ability. So we all could have a second house up here. You can Airbnb it all day long. It could be right next to my house, and you're pulling income to the tune of like $50,000 a year. And that's driving up the price of my house. So I'm paying more property taxes because of your investment in my community. None of this stuff is perfect. We can't hope for perfect. We can just aim to be more perfect. We have to, we have to go in willing to be honest with ourselves and honest with the reality of what we're looking at. No one's evil. There's no evil empire that made this. This is an attrition of well-intended ideas that fell into policy and you're reacting to them. And that's all. You know, it's like, can you change the tax system? Sure. I would highly recommend you do it. Is that going to happen overnight? No. Because you have to, you have to understand what's wrong first. 
Well, I think that's a great note to end on, trying to be more perfect. Thank you so much, Joe.